Hello, everyone. You're tuned into today's PIR live event, and I'm your host, Scott Jones. Our guest today is Dr. Ning Yan, a University of Toronto professor in the Faculty of Forestry. Uh, Dr. Ning Yan is also cross-appointed to the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry. Welcome to the PIR live event, Dr. Yan. Before we get started, I'd also like to welcome today's viewers watching the live stream. It's great to have you with us as always. Remember that you can tweet in your questions at any time using the hashtag AskPIR. If there's room in your tweet, please include your name, school, or city so we can give you a shout out. So I look forward to getting to those questions, but in the meantime, I'll, talk, I'll turn it over to Dr. Yan, who's going to talk to us a bit about her background and, more importantly, about her research, which I'm sure will be very exciting. So go ahead, Dr. Yan. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining in this call. Um, so, first of all, I'm a professor in Faculty of Forestry. Um, so my background, in fact, is uh, I'm an engineer, and uh, I'm a trained chemical engineer. The reason I'm in forestry, as you can see from the title of my talk, um, I'm working with biomass material, particularly material from forest. So I'm working uh, primarily focused on the forest material. So um, my group, my research group, we develop various type of new products and chemicals. You use them for the biomass as the raw material. And the idea here is to use the forest material that's sustainable, renewable, um, to be used as the raw material instead of the material that's derived from petroleum. So that's the main focus of my research. And uh, today I'm quite excited to talk about one of the projects that my group had worked quite hard on for the past uh, seven, eight years, is to primarily looking at uh, forest residue. Those are the tree barks. And uh, we are trying to use tree barks and to make various type of chemical products, industrial products, that again, with the focus or intention to replace raw materials and chemicals that are potentially made from petroleum. So today my talk will be on this bark biorefinery and to convert the bark materials to green chemicals. Um, before I start to talk about our research work, I will give you a little bit of background on the motivation and what, why, what interests us to do so. So I think all of you are quite familiar with tree barks. So barks are the outer layer of the tree trunk. And as shown here, there's one um, pretty image of a tree. So the tree barks, are, the primary function is to protect the wood tissue from exterior attack. And because of that, so the tree barks has some very nice, unique composition, contain a lot of chemicals, a quite unique and unique to, for that function, for protection function. Um, so some of these chemicals has some very nice uh, application for pharmaceutical medicine applications. And we think these chemicals can also have application for industrial products. And the tree bark is about a 10 to 15% of a tree's weight by weight. And right now, when a tree is cut down, the wood is hauled to a sawmill, and the tree barks are primarily generated as a waste stream. And very little um, high-valued applications has been sought, uh, has been basically uh, found for this type of uh, waste stream. And mostly it was just uh, burned to generate some heat. But barks are not that good of a heat material. First of all, it typically are wet when you take them out of the forest floor. And, uh, and uh, secondly, so when you want to ger generate heat, burn them, they have to first remove the moisture, then burn them. So the net heat generation is actually not very high. And uh, so in, in fact, that most of the times that's just a way to dispose the bark material as a waste. Some application used for mulching for growing plants or, but it's not a very uh, good application so far it's been found. But the barks cannot be left there, stay in, in a bark pile because they are dangerous and uh, can leach out the chemicals. Without going into great details, just want to say that from a, a 
you know, chemical perspective in terms of bark composition, bark is primarily consists of two types of chemicals. One, we call them polysaccharides, another one called polyphenolics. And polysaccharides are the ones first divided into cellulose and hemicellulose. Those are the key polymers which make you know, make up the wood material as well. So similarly, you can find in bark. Then another group of material, which show up in red here, are primarily lignins and extractives. So they are a little different type of chemicals. And uh, so our focus here is, can we take out some of these chemicals from bark and make some industrial products? And so don't be scared by all these formulas. <laughs> All I want to say is for those of you interested to know a little bit of chemistry, what they look like, this is what they look like. So I mentioned the names such as cellulose, hemicellulose. So those are the key component of a wood material that forms mostly the tree, plus the lignin. Lignin is the glue. So cellulose and hemicellulose are the, are the how do you say, um, are the component that carry out load, you know, in the wood. The rest of the extractives are the ones that show up here, quite, you know, large amount of them, different formulation. But the one type of the extractives we are particularly interested in called tannins. And tannins is not really unique to bark. You find tannins in various fruits, blueberries, and primarily is some sort of antioxidant. If you drink tea and coffee, those are all consists of tannins. If you drink red wine, you're too little to drink red drink red wines. But yeah, so those are consist of tannins. And those are the chemicals we are also quite interested because tannins, besides being very good for you for health, but also it's a, a very good for making some industrial products. Um, before we look at what we worked on in converting them into products, First, I just want to show you some data to tell you that actually bark as a waste material from sawmills is actually available in very large quantity. And here is a big table. You don't actually have to be more, you know, be, be that much distracted. Just look at the in Canada. And this is a little bit older data, but hasn't changed much. The total annual amount of bark available and this is a very interesting figure. It's presented in 1,000 oven dry tons. So because bark may contain some water, so this is measured only in the dried bark. So we have 2 million oven dried tons of bark available in Canada, which can be used to make something. So we are looking at huge amount of bark available annually in Canada, which is not found a very good application. That's why, so my research was thinking about maybe we can take this material and make some more valuable products out there. And the research is primarily funded on, under a various um, funding agency, but it's basically a team of companies where you see lots of logos here, and team of researchers from various universities. We form a group, we call this project called Bark Biorefinery. Um, the, purpose of this project is to convert bark, which is a forest residue, to various products. And we still focus on two types of products. One is adhesives and resins. Another one is foams. So here shows some picture of bark you can get. And the adhesives, uh, we are focused on other wood adhesives. The way you look at some forest products used to build houses or your, you know, the furniture or various wood-based products, we actually use some glue. So we are thinking, why don't we take these chemicals from bark, which are quite suitable for making glue, to make into glues to make those products. We also think of using bark chemicals to convert them into polyurethane foams. And these foams are used for various applications, including in the car, where the cushions you sit, and the bumpers, and the various parts of the materials. And the reason we're particularly interested in those two types of chemicals is adhesive is a quite large amount being used in North America. Four billion pounds a year adhesive are used for making those forest products in, in North America. And 40% are type of adhesive we call PF, are quite suitable if you look at the bark's comp uh, composition. And the adhesive in general, you know, is a very big market. The PF adhesive is not only for wood, it's used for making ship, making airplane, 
So it's a big industrial product sector. And if you look at polyurethane foam, and besides, you found foams everywhere in your car, automobile, your shoes, bottom of your sole, in the construction houses, in fridge. So you can think. So these are the reasons we choose. We think if we are successful, then perhaps these bark-based, bio-based products can use in many, many places, can have a bigger potential for usage. So the next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we have done in terms of technology development. First, I want to uh, just briefly explain a little bit. We use bark to make adhesives. Um, so if you just to summarize uh, the many years of work we have done is that if you think of a bark, they are like solid pieces. And we also worked quite a bit on these beetle infested bark because in the Western part of Canada, we have a problem with this mountain pine beetle infestation. So a lot of pines are being affected by this beetle. So we are using this kind of waste bark material. So we developed various techniques. The idea here is to convert this solid material into liquid form. So typically when we make adhesive, we want the liquid chemical form. And we want the liquid chemical form contain the chemicals we really want. So we, can, we develop two types of technology. One is basically using a chemical to convert it. Another one is to basically take out what we want and then make it into different adhesives. And this figure looks really busy, but really what I want to show you here is the y-axis is just to show you if you use adhesives to bond wood pieces to make products, how strong they are, okay, the bond strength. And you want the higher the better. And the, on the you know, horizontal axis, there are many groups. I just want to quickly go through it. First, we made a controlled uh, adhesive synthesized from petroleum pure chemical. We want to use that as comparison since we're making these bark-based adhesives. The second group is the, the, this kind of a petroleum-derived adhesive that you can buy off the market. Some company commercially produces it, so there are of the what's available um, products. The rest of what we made, and made it different conditions. All I want to show you here is this different color bar is to show this bond strength when it's wet condition, a dry condition, when it's wet condition, when you boil these pieces and the, in the hot water, then measure them again. All I want to say here is that the bark adhesive you can see has comparable, you know, performance in bonding to commercial and control adhesives. So it's very attractive. So we can use this type of product, bio-based, bark-derived product, to replace commercially available adhesives with acceptable um, performance. Next, we'll talk about other type of products we can make from bark. We can also make other type of resin. This is type of molding compound. So you can mold into different kind of you know, shapes and different products. And this also can be made from bark. And this is one example we have shown in bark made the molding compound, the resin as well. And we can also make the resins, you, you can impregnate different type of material. These are primarily material resins you use for your kitchen counters at home. Those kitchen counters, you can put hot pots and the cooked hot dish and they don't get burned. So those type of adhesive we can also make as well. And lastly, we're talking about making, using bark to make the polyurethane foam products. And this one, we also have to first take the solid bark and into convert to liquid feedstock, a liquid raw material to make the, the foam downstream. So here it just shows that, you know, you can do all kinds of research to see what's the temperature, what's the condition, how you can convert them, what's the best possible way of converting them. Then in the end, you can make these bark-based forms of different color and different properties and uh, made from different methods of conversion of bark material. And what we found is they have very good and attractive mechanical properties compared to what's available commercially. So all these have shown that, you know, bark is a very good candidate to make various type of industrial products to replace petroleum um, based um, chemicals. So 
Another example here is epoxy resin. And epoxy resin is used everywhere, not only in car, aerospace, in construction, in almost everyday life, in circuits. So you can also make epoxy resin from bark to replace bisphenol A, which we right now all heard a little bit about is a very toxic chemical. So just to summarize this project, so we are able to develop at you know, our lab various conversion techniques. We are able to synthesize various bark-based adhesives, bark-based polyurethane foam, bark-based resin, epoxy resin. They all have very good performance. So we think that these technologies are a way so as we going forward to better utilize this renewable, underutilized waste material from forest, um, forest, um, from forestry to replace some of this industrial chemical material from petrol, petroleum um, resources. I think that basically ends my general discussion. Thank the partners funding the research. Of course, mostly of the thank my postdocs and students who actually done the research. And I'm happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. That's all very interesting. Um, if you just want to go ahead and maybe close your, your PowerPoint slides there, we can see your full, full image for the okay. rest of the time. OK, very good. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, we have a very good one from Spencer Avenue Elementary School in Orangeville. And the students there want to know if some types of tree barks are superior to other types. That's a very good question. That's absolutely true. So different the trees, they vary a little bit in the chemical composition. So I'm not sure how familiar are you with the trees, but typically we, are, we have only two types of trees, even though they look very different. One type we call them softwoods. Those are the trees, it's other evergreen trees, your Christmas trees. They have many species, but those are the one type of trees. They, they always stay green. There's another, another type of tree, we call it hardwoods. Those are the trees like your maple trees. They are the ones that in the fall, the leaves will fall. So compare those two types of trees in general category, we found that for the products we want to make, the softwoods, the evergreen trees we found most in Canada is actually the best suited for those kind of application. But of course, there are also trees of different species in tropical forests, not in Canada. They also have some very unique properties, but definitely, tree species play an important role. Okay. Do, do you see some of the same properties in, in other plants and, and not just trees? Yeah, that's actually another very good question. So in fact, that this kind of technology can be used for pretty much all the biomass material, like plant material, agriculture residues, is not only restricted to trees. And of course, the the trees and the agriculture plants, they have a similarity in composition. They have a little bit of difference. But in fact, the, the, the technology definitely is, uh, are applicable. OK. Uh, you, you talked about a number of different applications of the, the tree bark, which, which I think we should get to a bit later. But I'm wondering, uh, the bark itself, how much do you have to engineer it before it can be made useful? Or is it useful as it is? Yeah, so bark itself is useful as it is, but what we need, like any industrial process, we may first have to um, prepare them into right size, so they may come in different sizes. And so you may have to have a, a process where, you know, taking them down to about the same size, then you can control the, the, the product a bit better. Then what we have done in developed technology is that the bark, as itself as a whole, um, because they consist of so many different types of polymers and the chemicals. So we want, they are not all suited for one particular application. So what we want to do is, can we find the process of separate bark into different type of material? Then this different type of material can then convert it into different, various different type of products that they are most suited for. And do you actually work with the bark in, in your labs? And if so, where, where does that come from? How do you get a hold of yeah, it? Yeah, we have all 
kind of parts in my lab. So we have softwood, we have beetle infest books, we have pine, we have spruce, we have aspen, we have maple, we have all you name it. So we get them from various uh, mills, sawmills, and the companies we just contact them says, look, we are working with Spark and develop some new products, send us some of your parts for us to, to research. Generally, they're very excited that they send us right away. Sometimes they send us more than what we want for, but yeah, we have lots of parts in the lab. Because otherwise, I guess it would just go to waste, you were saying, right? It would just be used as, as a heat source or? Yeah, so in the newer sawmills, and they could, they usually have a boiler in place and to at least to burn them off. Because if these sawmills are very high productivity mills, means that they produce a lot of different kinds of products, they generate a lot of barks. As I show you some data, millions, million, million tons, that's a lot. You cannot just leave them and form a pile because they are dangerous for the environment, they're dangerous for the fire hazard. So even if they don't recover much heat, they will at least as a way to get rid of them. But in the smaller sawmills, they may not have such, um, you know, set up like a boiler to burn the bark. So sometimes they have to pay people to haul this away as a way sent to landfill or sent to nursery, find ways to get rid of it. So it's uh, definitely a not very well utilized uh, material. I see. Um so you talked a bit about comparing the utility of bark versus uh, current products in the market. Um, I'm wondering, like, can you think of any bio-based BPA replacements that are currently in use in everyday items? Or is it all just uh, still being researched? There is quite a bit of, uh, um, you know, bio-based materials in various products. For example, let's talk about the car, because I mentioned the car. Uh, in the car, like the bumper material right now, uh, in many cars are having some percentage of biofibers. I mean, fibers from trees or fiber from plants. And, uh, you know, um, both also um, some interior load floor, you know, in the trunk, when you open up your trunk, you have a, a floor where you put luggage on. Those are now, many cars are made from containing some biomass material as well. And in terms of uh, uh, chemicals, there's a lot of plastic products are being replaced by chemicals and material from trees and from plants. Um, so definitely this is, um, you know, is, is an ongoing research field, but, but also it is a place where Gradually, you see actual commercial products coming out. But this is actually this replacement of petroleum based product by biomass derived products. It's a slow but growing process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are there any harmful chemicals that can, can leach out of bark piles and maybe cause an environmental issue if we don't make use of, of them before that happens? Yes, that's what I mentioned, that you cannot have a bark pile and sit there for too long. For the same reason I explained that this bark contains lots of uh, rich, very rich, uh, large amount of different chemicals. Some of these chemicals, if you leach a lot out, it actually uh, is not very good for aquatic life. It can be, a, you know, uh, not desirable for the environment. So that's why we do need to do something about it. So that's why the mills are forced to get rid of them, you know, regardless, they cannot store them as a pile. But uh, what we have been focused on is that we think it's not just get rid of them, we think that you can actually, because these chemicals, in fact, that you can use them, you can make, use these chemicals that, you know, to make some useful products at the end. Okay. Um, is there any way, I know it's just still, an emerging technology, but say I'm a consumer and I'm going out to, to buy a car, is there any way whether I can tell that that product was a bio-based product or not? I don't think that in the dealership they market that, just because I think people, consumer, are not that aware of these um, products. Some people may even worry whether they are as strong as other like conventional plastics and the products out there. But um, Many companies has been, 
you know, applying this type of materials for many reasons, not only for green, but also for lightweight fuel consumptions and for other performance uh, reasons. So, for example, Ford, Toyota, Mercedes, uh, Volkswagen, all these companies now um, are having those components inside their car. They may not go to the dealership to market you, but perhaps if you ask them, maybe they know. But, uh, but yeah, I don't think it has been very you know, widely advertised. Okay, but they are quite willing to, to take on this new technology then. Yeah, they are... They are very excited in take on technology. That's why you see we done some like bio-based foam as well. It's just that uh, there's also regulation in Europe and uh, in Japan that uh, they mandate an increased bio content in their car. So they are also forced a little bit uh, to move towards that direction. And then plus the added benefit they can have because the bio material are very lightweight. So a car wants lightweight in terms of fuel consumption. So there are some added performance attributes, so they are moving definitely towards that direction. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I took a quick look at your, your website and I saw even um, a bunch more applications of, of the bark. Um, can you tell us maybe a bit more about, um, so I read about diagnostic sensors you were talking about. How, how does that apply? Okay, the, yeah, so my group also do some, um, we also develop some food sensors. So you see, as you know, when you go to the supermarket, you see those foods and you buy them. Sometimes they might already turn bad. So we developed some, we thought of developing some sensors that can have an indicator, can tell you that, okay, this meat already gone bad, don't buy it. Or maybe you can know it in your fridge that something already gone bad, you better toss out and buy new ones. But that is not directly using bark. We are, we, uh, I'm doing that project in utilizing cellulose material as the, the, the way to carry the sensor material so that we can build as part of the sensor to hopefully can detect the, when the foods turn bad. So it's not directly from bark, but it's from the wood, from the, from the forest material um, as, as a whole, the cellulose material that I'm, I'm working with. Cool, cool. Um, so we've covered a lot of ground here, but do you ever find in, in working in the lab or maybe with your students that you, you come across something that you, you weren't expecting? There's, you put certain chemicals together and you come up with something that was just a complete surprise to you? Or, or do you know what you're I looking for in advance it. usually? Yeah, that, that always happens. In fact, that, um, um, even when we were developing these various uh, resins, we also observed that. We didn't think it was going to work, and then we tried it, and actually by accident, sometimes the student mixed up the conditions, and we found that they actually it will work as well. And of course, uh, that's a part of the fun of doing research. You know, you have an idea, and you try it out in the lab, and of course, many times it doesn't really work because you missed some parts, but then you also sometimes get this the pleasant surprises in the work the, that you did not thought was going to work. <laughs> so that's part of the fun of being in the lab to research. For sure, for sure. Um, maybe for, for our students that are watching, um, say they are interested in engineering, um, maybe they pursue a degree in chemical engineering like you did, uh, what, what other avenues are available to them? Um, besides what you found yourself involved with? Um, to, I think engineering is, in general, is a um, discipline that um, been different from the, fundam let's say, chemical engineering versus chemistry. Um, it's good, it's important you have a good chemistry background or for any engineering, mechanical engineering, it's good you have some uh, physics background and electrical engineering, also physics background. Um, but the engineering as a discipline is more about how to make something, how to make a change in our everyday lives. It's more applied. So, in the, um, so when you look at arts and science and engineering, arts and science may be more research or fundamental, um, fundamental like understanding. That is actually can have a huge impact many years down the road. So engineers tend to be the ones, okay, we know something in theory, how can I make our current product better? How can I make it apply in our current, you know, living conditions and make us, you know, living more comfortable, do things better for the environment? And so that's a bit different in, in, the, in the discipline. But uh, to be, 
if you're interested in chemical engineer, of course, you it's good that you learn some more chemistry. But chemical engineer itself has a very wide application. You can, like me, I'm actually work in developing new type of mat materials and chemicals. Working with biomass, you can have food engineering, you can have biomedical engineering. We all involve chemistry as well. So I think there's many possible avenues you can pursue a research career or work career along the engineering field. But ultimate goal as an engineer is to hopefully make a difference in the ways we do things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the appeal of engineering too, is you get to work with a bunch of different uh, scientists and the people who actually put these, manufacture these products and it bridges lots of disciplines, doesn't it? Yeah, so like my student, even though as he said, we work a lot in the lab, in fact, we work very closely also with, with manufacturers. We go to the mills, we collect material, we, we develop some technology, we do test trials at our company side, they actually make some tests themselves, they synthesize some resin. So it's very applied. It's directly linked to manufacturing, linked to products uh, in that way. Right, right. Okay, um, I think unfortunately that's probably all the time we have. We're at 11.30. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to everyone that tuned in and sent in their questions on Twitter. And then of course to you, Dr. Yan, for taking the time to answer those questions and share your expertise with us today. Um, so thank you. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to our uh, live event that is happening next Tuesday, February 23rd, when we'll be talking to Dr. John Small from Queen's University, and he's going to be talking about climate change and its particular effect on the Arctic. So we look forward to that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jan, again. Okay, thank you. Yep. Talk to you later. Bye-bye for now. Yeah. Bye.